This module looks at the development of the Common Intention Constructive Trust in the English courts. In a separate module, we'll look at how Hong Kong's courts have developed the law in this area. It makes sense to start with the English law, since Hong Kong's courts make express reference to it, even while they sometimes consciously differ from it. To keep each module relatively short, this introduction to the Common Intention Constructive Trust is split into two modules. The 2007 House of Laws decision in Stack and Dowden can be said to have fundamentally reshaped the law in this area. This module describes the law of the Common Intention Constructive Trust from its beginnings in 1970 up to Stack and Dowden. The second module looks at Stack and Dowden and the way in which it and subsequent decisions have shaped the law in this area. Like all the other modules, these introductions to the Common Intention Constructive Trust identify important issues and questions that you might want to explore in your research work. They draw your attention to cases and other references that you can make use of. It isn't possible to do more than outline the key themes that we'll return to in later modules. These modules don't set out to explain the law, but to make you reflect on it. They assume that you've already had an introduction to the law in this area, or that you read one of the many textbooks that explain it. The House of Lords decision in Pettit and Pettit in 1970 and Gissing and Gissing in 1971 are the foundations of the law of the Common Intention Constructive Trust. In these decisions, the House of Lords identify the core problem that the law needs to deal with. The problem at that time was that married couples were divorcing and there was no statutory ancillary relief regime that the courts could use when dividing the family's wealth typically mainly tied up in the family home between the couple. The central idea to emerge from these decisions is that the courts are to assume that couples reached an agreement when they bought the family home as to their ownership rights in the family home. When the couple break up, the aim of the courts is to give effect to this agreement or common intention. Crucially, the House of Laws insisted that this common intention was an actual common intention. The courts had always to imagine that at the start of their married life, the couple had a shared understanding about the ownership of the family home. The courts were not to impute a common intention to the parties. The courts were not free to divide the ownership of the family home according to notions of fairness. The essential elements of a common intention constructive trust are one, an actual common intention to create the trust and two, detrimental reliance on that common intention. Detrimental reliance is necessary because these informal trusts do not satisfy the formalities requirements for the creation of express trusts of land. Detrimental reliance substitutes for compliance with these formalities. The insistence on an actual common intention gives rise to a dilemma. The members of the House of Lords were aware that in most cases there was no actual common intention. They acknowledged that it would be highly unusual for couples to sit down and talk about what share each of them had in the family home. The couple's assumption would usually be that this question has no practical importance since the family home is theirs. It will be the setting for their married life and the raising of any children that they might have. Typically, their intention as to the ownership of the family home is never addressed. It's made irrelevant by their intention to remain committed to the relationship, which will be lived out in the family home. If there were evidence that the couple had discussed ownership rights in the family home and reached an agreement, then this would be the best evidence of their common intention. But this will rarely be the case, so the courts are forced to look for other evidence of the couple's common intention. They will necessarily have to infer the intention from conduct. 
the courts look for behaviour that's evidence of a common intention concerning ownership. This is a highly artificial exercise, but it's one that's forced on the courts once they've decided that the ownership question is to be decided by reference to an actual intention that was never really formed. The courts have to decide what evidence they will regard as being a reliable guide to the couple's ownership intentions. This question was addressed by the House of Lords in its 1990 decision in Lloyds Bank and Rossett. The essential ideas to emerge from this decision are that the common intention can only be inferred from contributions to purchase price. These financial contributions can either be contributions made at the time of purchase or contributions to the payment of mortgage instalments. Lord Bridge's judgment in Lloyds Bank and Rossett also emphasised the need to distinguish between joint name cases and sole name cases. Where the legal title to the family home was in the couple's joint names, it could be assumed that they were co-owners, and the only question concerned the size of their respective shares. Where, on the other hand, the title was in the sole name of just one of the couple, then the first question was whether or not the other party could establish the existence of a trust, a common intention that he or she was a co-owner, even though his or her name was not on the title deeds. Only if that hurdle was overcome did the courts need to consider the quantification question to decide on the size of each party's share in the family home. In Burns and Burns, the English Court of Appeal had to consider whether the common intention could be inferred from domestic conduct, such as looking after the home and the family. This will be an especially important question where one of the couple has made the decision to give a higher priority to this at the expense of a career. This decision may mean that it's difficult or impossible to make the kinds of financial contributions envisaged by Lloyd's Bank and Rossett. In Burns and Burns it was decided that it was not possible to infer the common intention from this domestic conduct.